Welcome to the second season of Epic Earth. Epic Earth is a podcast for those curious about the STEM fields and the awesome, quirky, and fun experiences and research that is taking place right now. This is episode number nine, a day at the museum where nature comes alive. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride as we take a journey around this epic earth. How are elements distributed in a planetary body? What are our hopes? What are our dreams? What do we want to accomplish? And how do we accomplish it? We can have all the science in the world, but if it's not translated, how is that helpful? Welcome everyone to another episode of Epic Earth. With me as always, I have my awesome sidekicks, Brian Rosenblatt. Howdy. And Scott Gavain. How's it going? And today we have a special guest um, joining us all the way from Santa Barbara, California, Jenna Roll. Hi, Jenna. Hi. <laughs> um, so Jenna is uh, the Director of Education at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History and Sea Center. Um, she is also a good friend of one of our assistant professors, Dan Luna. Um, so that's awesome. We've, we've actually talked about Dan a lot on this podcast. I feel like everyone knows Dan and <laughs> yeah. so, um, and before you got into, uh, the Santa Barbara museum, you actually received a bachelor of science in molecular biology mm-hmm. and a master's in earth sciences from the university of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Correct. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so maybe we can hear a little bit more about that and part of your journey in a little bit. Right. Um, but it also says that you teach a course called Dinosaurs. And Dan has talked a lot about this course because he used to teach it. Is that right? That's right. <laughs> and it just sounds like a fascinating course. So um, maybe you could just start by telling us a little bit about that course and what it entails. Sure. Yeah. Um, maybe Dan's talked about it on um, before, but we sort of hoodwink students into this course with a flashy title. Um, so I'm very quick, like on the first day to say, like, we will definitely talk about dinosaurs, but you're going to get like so much more than just that out of this class, because it is sort of more like an introduction to paleontology and um, the history of life on Earth, kind of framing where dinosaurs fall into that much bigger picture, which I think gives them a much deeper, richer context, um, you know, in the whole history of life. Um, It just kind of like gives a a broader appreciation for a lot of things that have existed. But yeah, it's a super fun course. I've taught it at um, UC Santa Barbara um, while Dan and I were both there. And now I teach it at Santa Barbara City College, um, which has been a, you know, just it, fantastic. Um, Santa Barbara City College is this really wonderful community college that we have here that um, has a fantastic little community and sort of uh, bittersweet. This is my last semester teaching that course um, for the foreseeable future. Um, my life got exponentially busier um, <laughs> in the past six months. And so um, this will be the first time since, let's see, 2000. 12 that I won't be teaching um, a, a college course. So it's probably about time for a little break <laughs> anyway. Yeah, it, there's a lot that goes into planning and teaching college courses, um, as we all are aware, being TAs and then ob- obviously professors as well. Um, but that's super awesome. And I know Dan is like just talked about that course and just how amazing it was and and how engaged the students were in that in that course. And I would really um, love to see something like that here at Boise State. We do have some great introductory courses to the geosciences, but I remember taking an earth history in my sort of uh, undergrad and um, it just turned out to be one of the coolest classes that I took. Um, yeah, you just yeah, it's just a nice little like primer. It's not, you know, super in depth. You could go, you know, um, before I started teaching at City College, it was taught by um, Dr. Bob Gray, who um, is famous within the Santa Barbara community because he basically started the Earth Sciences Department at Santa Barbara City College. Um, and the way he taught the dinosaurs course is very different from how Dan and I approach it. His was much more like detailed morphology and like, you know, this process, you know, okay. in this process of this bone, you know, <laughs> what they, what they sort of just more anatomy. And so you could take that direction, but I think Dan and I 
both something that we both became, um, you know, connected us as friends very quickly was this much more like holistic approach to teaching about the history of life, whether it's from the paleontology side or, or modern sort of bringing them together. Yeah, that's great. I mean, so many of our disciplines, I mean, just go together, right? It's like a whole picture. So geology is like it's separate study, but it, it impacts and is impacted by so many other disciplines within our field. And um, it's cool to see all of that um, sort of in one spot. And just, yeah, that's great. Um, cool. So uh, do you want to just tell us a little bit about who you are? Um, so what makes you, you, Jenna? Sure. So I <laughs> sort of been thinking about this was like, I'm, when I start thinking about who I am, like my base uh, sort of like go to is just to like really boil it down and make it really simple. And uh, it's like, I like earth. And I think everybody in this uh, interview can agree on that fact that earth is pretty cool. Um, but it really impacts like all of the areas of my life that I'm, you know, most active in. And so um, whether that be sort of things that I like to do in my own personal time. So I love like playing literally in the dirt. Um, being outside is, um, is my favorite thing. And I'm sure you all feel very similarly, but it really shapes my hobbies. I'm into um, trail running mostly, but also mountain biking and climbing. Um, but then it's also really, really shaped what I decided to do um, as a career path. So um, I, I grew up uh, on a farm <laughs> in South Dakota. And so it's probably a little bit of that, like sort of like feral outdoor, like life. <laughs> um, that's just sort of innate within me. But um, I was one of the first people in my family to go to college and was had one of those moments where I was like, okay, what do you know? Um, you know, what do you know how to do? And so it's really what got me um, into the path of, of the sciences. And so I wasn't in undergrad really sure what direction I wanted to go in, like most undergrads. Um, and so I simultaneously um, was getting all of my pre-med requirements. So I was like, I could always fall back on being a doctor. <laughs> Which is all <laughs> oh, weird. I love it. <laughs> weird mentality. <laughs> but what I could tell was that my real like passion and desire was in academic um, research. Um, during my undergrad, I was working um, in a lab that was looking at bioluminescent bacteria and sort of how, when, and why they um, sort of accumulated the genes that make them what I'd like to say glowy. Um, Chuck Wimpy, if you're listening to this, I understand deeply that they do not glow. Um, <laughs> don't come for me. <laughs> um, but we were just thinking about where did these genes come from? Where did they live within these bacteria's genome? And how, when did they acquire them essentially? And so we were looking at modern day environments and trying to like backtrack through evolutionary history to figure out um, an answer to this, this question. Um, and I was so into that. And like, my parents were like, you're going to become a doctor. And I was like, they don't know that I'm going to become a scientist. <laughs> um, and it's what really got me actually interested in the earth sciences, um, was thinking about, you know, looking at evolution or the, the, I should say the traits that something has acquired today and looking at those set of traits and thinking, you know, working my way back through evolution, I realized that I didn't really have a very strong foundation in sort of the other end of that, which is where did we begin and how did we get here? Um, and so in expressing that to my advisor at the time, uh, he was like, oh, you should probably take some earth science courses. Um, and so I took one and I was like, wow, like, this was like, this was where, where I think the academic bridge was built for me, which was like, you can take something like earth sciences and something like biology, and you can like, look at what's happening right now. And you can look at what's happened in the past or the evidence that we have for what's happened in the past and like build these, con these connections together. And you get to go outside and like work in the dirt. So like, how is this not the most perfect career path ever? Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, that's, that's, I guess, sort of like a little bit about, um, my, my journey into 
this career path, um, but just kind of in general, I'm really, really fascinated by all things that are, you know, abiotic and biotic um, at all times in Earth's history. And I'm just really especially intrigued by things like phenomena. So, um, you know, things like origin and extinction have been the things that have really shaped my, my interests um, in Earth sciences. Um, but I'm into like all sorts of things. So like, you know, how mountains are built and, um, you know, seasonality and how things work on a much more like, you know, uh, universal level, um, but then all the way down to like really esoteric stuff. Like right now <laughs> I'm like kind of obsessed with cults. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. I'll just go ahead and expose myself. Um, <laughs> not necessarily because I want to be a part of a cult, but I just <laughs> want, I'm just interested in, in um, sort of the stigmas that are around like things like brainwashing and like thought terminating cliches and just kind of all the lore. Um, so I, I can become like pretty easily obsessed with like very like um, esoteric um, information. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> While we're talking about cults and phenomena, sure. do, you have a, do you have a favorite like extinction event? Oh yeah, thank you for asking. <laughs> so my, you would think because I teach a dinosaurs course that maybe the KPG is my favorite, mm -hmm. but I really do think that um, just because something is like, I, it's just the sexiest extinction event, right? Like, <laughs> and that's cool, but really uh, my favorite extinction event is the end Permian mass extinction. Um, it was the focus of my, my master's thesis, um, specifically I was, my lab was interested in, uh, which, or which marine organisms, um, invertebrates were in oceans prior to the extinction event and which ones were in oceans immediately following the extinction event and why, like what was the selective pressures? Why did certain things survive and certain things didn't? Um, and those are like big, big questions. Um, and so why not take like the hugest disaster in all of earth's history so far, <laughs> um, and try to like, uh, you know, tease out some of the mysteries of, of what stuck around. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. That is awesome. Can you just tell us, um, we're not going to put you on the spot or anything, but what's one of the biggest species that, that, um, went extinct after that? Um, oh man. Well, I think the one that really like invertebrate wise probably tugs on the heartstrings the most is the trilobite. Um, yeah. I've never said that combination of words together. <laughs> I realized immediately how nerdy it sounded. <laughs> um, but you know, we all know trilobites, they think, well, you know, trilobites are these things that were super populous in the oceans and pretty diverse and, um, seeing those go. And then a lot of like, I think the shelled cephalopods. Um, ammonoids hung around after the fact for a while into the Mesozoic, but eventually went extinct as well. It was, you know, um, yeah, a mega hit, you know, like Eurypterids, sea scorpions. Yeah. Yeah. We, you know, we had some casualties, but what I always like to say is like, we got some pretty cool stuff in exchange, like things that were kind of hanging around, like our fringe invertebrates that were kind of hanging around, kind of got, uh, their time in the sun they got their time to shine so now we get to have you know get to see more of these really beautiful my focus was echinoids specifically looking at sea urchins um so you know now we get to see a beautiful plethora of different types of sea urchins <laughs> yeah that's awesome I um I worked in a geology museum when I was an undergrad we had a really small one at the school I went to and we had this massive collection of trilobites and I I don't know, I probably worked in that museum for like two years and every day when I would go in, I would just find like a new species of like trilobite. There's yeah. so many of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they were probably, I mean, they were definitely the the heaviest hit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are, they're super cool though. And like something so awesome about um, being in those earth history classes and that dinosaur class is that you get to like experience that. You get to learn about that kind of stuff, which is, fascinating yeah yeah and that's why I say like yeah you're going to learn about dinosaurs but I'm also going to find all of these avenues to sneak in all of these other things that personally I think oh this is going to be an unpopular opinion um <laughs> this is just a podcast of me exposing myself at this point but 
um, I like wasn't one of those kids who like grew up like wanting to be a paleontologist. I don't know. Like I, so many people in the, in the field of paleontology were like, especially like, I think young, young boys, like are like, yeah, I'm going to grow up and be like a paleontologist and find dinosaurs. I just like never in my childhood. Um, I was like, I was more like an astronaut kid. Um, I was like, get me out of here. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But I think pretty much anybody in South Dakota can relate to that mentality. Um, (laughs) But uh, yeah, so while I think dinosaurs are like fascinating and cool, and I am very grateful to them for being so popular because they keep me employed. um, It is definitely an opportunity for me to like sprinkle in all this other, these other organisms and times throughout Earth's history and concepts like plate tectonics and stuff like that, um, and really expose uh, students to those sorts of things. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how, how much time outside of the dinosaurs, like there actually exists on this earth. And there's a lot of history in that, that time period that, yeah, yeah people don't normally think about, but there's some really cool stuff to think about. Definitely. Um, So awesome. That's awesome that you got to teach that class, but also that you get to explore your curiosities. And, and I think a lot of us are drawn into um, these fields because we are so curious about processes and things that are happening on the earth. And, you know, you're talking about like going out maybe you're on a trail run or you're mountain biking and you're looking at a mountain and you're going like, how does this mountain get here? I don't, you know, or what's happening to it? Why is it crumbling or why, you know? So um, I think a lot of people who get into this um, field are people who are just very curious about, you know, something that is happening here on earth or maybe on another planet. And that's super cool. And I think the hallmark too of a, of a, good professor is to start putting some of the like nuggets of that kind of question asking into students. Um, because I, I mean, some of us grow up innately curious, right? I think everybody is, but depending on, you you know, your situation in life, um, you may not have as much opportunity to foster those, you know, curious thoughts, um, for various different reasons. And so something, at City College, especially, that's been sort of my mission is to like really get students comfortable, like being a little bit un- uncomfortable, I guess, like being like, you know, we don't, not everything has a, a quick and dirty answer to it. Like we should like be questioning all the stuff around us. It's the greatest, like, you know, thing you can possibly do is question yourself, question each other, question, question everything. And so like, um, d- don't be afraid to like, f- not have the answer and like fail a little bit, like, mm. yeah, t- take the chance and like get curious. Yeah. As a, as an undergrad at Boise state, they emphasize making you feel like you don't know what's going on. And then <laughs> like, we would go out sometimes and map rocks and make up all these theories. And then they just wouldn't tell us if we were correct. So we would just be like, I don't know. <laughs> and that's, that's science. I love, I love your perspective on that. Yeah. It's, and it's the same thing that holds true, um, sort of here at the museum it, on a, on a younger level. So, um, most of the students we interact with here are between, um, kindergarten and fifth grade, we do have programming for older students. Before I was director of education, I was actually the teen programs manager. And so, um, I spent the last few years hanging out with a group of very, um, nerdy, but also very simultaneously, very cool teenagers, um, who are all about getting into science and nature, but it's the same philosophy here. Um, you know, we want to expose kids to the outdoors, um, who, whether they've had experience in the outdoors or not in really approachable ways. Um, you know, a very simple example is that most children are kind of like taught to be afraid of things like insects and getting dirty and getting wet. And here it's about providing them with a accessible, comfortable space where we can encourage them to interact with things um, so that they don't feel scared. And something um, we try to always avoid saying is be careful, be careful kind of comes with baggage that you, there's something to be feared. And so we just ask kids here to 
um, you know, to, we, we give them the resources to take calculated risk and just ask them to make smart choices essentially. So we like to give, um, whether, whether, yeah, whether it's young kids or teenagers, we like to give them autonomy to, um, interact with the world around them so that we kind of like foster this like stewardship and care for the environment around them, but also just a basic introduction of like, um, you don't have to be in the mountains to, you know, interact and appreciate nature. Like there are like these like little slender salamanders in your backyard, or like just look at a, a, a tree or a flower and just observe what you're seeing. Mm-hmm. And yeah, with that's- technology, we can just go on Google Earth and fly around. You know, that was one of the things I loved doing as a kid rather than my schoolwork. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's that's awesome, Jenna. That um, the museum and the education field does that. I like that aspect because I do think, you know, there is an element of sort of hesitation to get into things like geoscience because people are daunted by it. They think, you know, all it requires is a lot of math and a lot of science, and they're not really like, you know, prepared to go into those fields or they are they they are, you know, maybe like they're not that great at math or they're not that great at science. And so it sort of deters them. But I think part of um, why we have this podcast and really what like the outreach sort of programs do is to say, hey, like these fields are actually way more accessible to you guys than you actually think. And, and it's okay if you're not good at science and it's okay if you're not good at math, like there's something about you, which you're awesome at and like would be so beneficial to these fields. So Right. And it's not like universities and or science departments don't have support and resources and community that, you know, can, if you are struggling in some area, you know, you have a a network of peers that you can work with. You have resources at your university that can tutor you and assist you as well. And so, yeah, no longer should there be barriers like I'm not good at math um, for these types of for any of the STEM fields. Absolutely, well said. Um, so I guess that's kind of a great segue into sort of your director of education at the museum. So um, just, do you wanna tell us a little bit about what that entails and sort of um, how you got involved with that? Sure. Um, so here at the museum, uh, our education division has a number of different departments in it. Um, I should first say the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History is a pretty small nonprofit organization um, within the community. The museum's been around for over a hundred years. And so we have this really beautiful campus that's sort of set back in the foothills of Santa Barbara that has a beautiful amount of um, outdoor space that we really take advantage of um, in all of our educational programming. The education division is made up of different departments that provide nature adventure camps, nature Mm -hmm. education, um, school group field trips. And then, as I said earlier, teen programs. So we have this really great um, sort of multi-year internship program for teens where they come in as freshmen and they dedicate their entire high school career um, to working. They do get paid um, for some of their hours, but they also get a lot of community service hours throughout their entire high school career. Um, And so they get to work in our collections and research department. They get to work in every aspect of the museum, whether it be like exhibits, marketing, administration, guest services, so that they get a really holistic feel of how a museum actually operates. Um, And then they also get some scientific um, research experience as well. Um, So we have that. And then we have an astronomy department. Um, as well as community education. So my job is to oversee all of those departments. And I like to say that like, I'm kind of like WD-40, or at least I hope I am, um, is just to keep all of the things sort of moving smoothly so that the people who are really the passionate experts in their departments can do what they do best and not have to worry about some of the, um, you know, you know, maybe not as sexy and fun sorts of things like budget making and um, approval for different sorts of things and uh, grant writing, things like that. Mm -hmm. 
all the behind the scenes stuff that goes into it. Yeah. You might have mentioned this, but are is it free to the students or do they pay a membership or something to join these sort of educational programs? Yeah. So Quasars to Sea Stars, um, which is the multi-year um, teen program, is is free. Um, it's underwritten so that anybody, so that it is accessible to anybody who wants to partake in it. It does have limited capacity. Um, so there's um, a little bit of an application process, but um, we have a fantastically diverse group of students that come from, you know, all sorts of um, types of communities and families throughout Santa Barbara. Um, and then um, most of our, the services that we do offer in education are either, um, you know, free of charge or at very, or at low, lower cost. Um, yeah, so that they are accessible at different levels as well. That's awesome. That's yeah. super cool to hear. Um, great. Yeah. And so uh, I guess that's just slightly different than what you used to do, which was mainly research. Obviously, as a PhD student, that's all you do. So, <laughs> yeah. um, so how does that feel for you? How different is that? And sort of what drew you into the museum environment? Great question. Yeah. So I, after finishing up, I guess I'll do a little bit of a, a history review. After finishing up my, my master's at the University of Wisconsin, um, I came out to Santa Barbara and was working on my PhD um, in a fantastic lab, but was kind of seeing like, I don't know that this is the direction I want to go in. Um, so I had gotten a couple of years into my PhD and sort of made the very hard decision that um, I wasn't going to pursue this PhD any further. Um, it wasn't, I didn't see myself, you know, I just wasn't inspired by it anymore. It kind of was starting to feel like I, um, a little bit of like a, a bird in a cage where it just felt like my, my reach wasn't enough for me. Um, I wanted to have some broader impacts um, throughout, you know, the scientific community and throughout um, my own community, um, whether that be Santa Barbara or, or something larger. Um, and so my research was kind of starting to feel like, well, I just feel like I'm having the same conversations about the same things with the same people, like over and over again. And it just wasn't enough for me. So um, I decided like, okay, you can leave your PhD. That is okay. Um, that's not a personal failing on you, but you better go if like, community impact and um, public education is really what's important to you, then you better figure out a way to make it happen in a big way. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so after I left my PhD, um, I hung out in Santa Barbara and the museum had a very part-time position. Um, they had a naturalist position that worked on Saturday and Sunday mornings. And so I was like, I'll take it. <laughs> Um, and our naturalists at the museum are part of the education division, and they work in a space that we have called the Curiosity Lab, which is sort of an indoor um, exploratory space. And then we also have a backyard and clubhouse, which is this back outdoor exploratory space. Um, and so that's where I worked when I first got here. And just kind of at the same time, um, because working two mornings a week wasn't enough, um, was like working at REI. And then... Um, <laughs> <laughs> which it's interesting. So many people I find throughout like the earth sciences community at some time or another have like worked at REI. <laughs> if you haven't yet, you might. <laughs> it's, coming. it's coming. I have a feeling. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then just sort of out of, I think, luck, um, city college also needed a dinosaurs teacher. And so, um, there was a brief, I shouldn't even say brief, there was a couple year period where I was working three jobs, <laughs> just making it work. But um, opportunities opportunities opened up here at the museum. Um, I moved into the teen programs department um, and got my my full time position as teen programs manager and was in that position for a few years. Um, and really, just the more time I spent with this organization, the more. Um, I don't know. It's, it's a fantastic, I, I, some people like to say like family, I, I think the word family has a lot of baggage, honestly, but it's, it's a fantastic nonprofit organization to work for. And so a lot of people will come in and want to stay for a, a very long time. Um, 
And yeah, I guess the director of education position came open um, right at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and so, you know, I interviewed for it at that time. We, the museum as an organization decided, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. So they just kind of waited, um, waited things out. And then this past summer, um, I was promoted into that position. Um, and it's, it's great. I, I think something that's really important to me is being able to partner and have meaningful collaborations with other um, community entities. So it's really great to be in a position where I can sort of work with a fantastic team of educators and say like, what are our hopes? What are our dreams? What do we want to accomplish? And how do we accomplish it? Um, while um, being very mindful about creating accessible opportunities that are inclusive and make people feel like they belong and invite new people to the table here at the museums. Um, museums have a history. Oh gosh, they have a history in all sorts of different sorts of ways. But one of those ways is sort of being catering to a certain group of people, which are mostly white people. Um, and so one of our, you know, one of the things that I have my eye on is making sure that we are creating um, programs that reach truly every, the demographic makeup of our county um, and sort of try to lead the way in, in programming that is accessible to all. That's so amazing. I love all of that. And I'm, I'm actually really happy that you, you brought to light your story about your PhD experience, because I think, um, you know, a lot of people, especially grad students, like, you know, they think I'm in this program and I've got to finish it out. And, you know, they may not like enjoy that journey as much as they, they thought they would. And I, so I think it's really important to say, Hey, like if it's not working for you, you know, like, it's okay to like walk away from it. It's okay. Like no one's going to judge you for that because, you know, like it's a lot of time and a lot of energy to be putting towards something that you, you're not enjoying. So. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, we live in like a society that is like, so, uh, I don't know, like hung up on, on success and completion and, you know, the hustle, the grind and some of that glorifies like, it. Yeah. Glorifies yeah. The, the overworking. Yeah, absolutely. Grad school is a perfect example of how all of those things sort of like convalesce together and get glorified. And that's okay. You know what? That's, it is what it is. And I'm not here to like <laughs> um, say that, you know, it, it, it works. It, yeah. It, um, for, what, for some what, people, for sure. Like they yeah. like that structure and they like that. Okay. I, I know it's like a grind for the next three or four, five years. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, I, you know, I had some other things going on in my life too. And it was really coming clear to me, like that I wasn't willing to like sacrifice my happiness and my future and staying in that program would have been not only like, you know, potentially, you know, a waste of my time, but it would have been a waste of that department's resources. I felt like Mm -hmm. uh, that could have been better put towards someone else whose heart was really in it and could, and could be there. Um, and so, yeah, I think that, you know, it's something that we, we preach in science all the time is, is that one of the best things that can happen with, you know, the scientific method is that, uh, you know, your hypothesis is proven wrong and that you fail, mm -hmm. right? We talk about this a lot. Um, I try to get my students, like I said before, like kind of good with the idea of failure. Um, and I was like, well, okay, I've really been pushing this, like you should fail thing. So if I'm going to talk the talk, I should probably walk the walk. <laughs> and, you know, it's not, it's not really a failure. Right. Um, but it feels like it definitely, definitely feels like it in the moment where you're like, okay, I'm going to walk away from my PhD. Yeah. Um, but yeah. it honestly was the best decision. Absolutely. 100% without any, without any regret. Um, it was absolutely the right decision for me. That's great. And, but I also really liked how, you know, you sort of, um, opened up the possibility that even if you don't complete 
you know, a master's or a PhD in the field. There are still lots of other ways that you can get involved in the sciences and the STEM fields without, you know, maybe not completing that degree necessarily. But if you if it's something that you're really passionate about, there are so many different avenues in, in order to sort of um, access and reach whatever your goals are in life with it. So absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people might not realize when they get into a PhD program that you are expected to push the barrier of human thought like that. That is the expectation. And just a friend of mine was, was like trying to piece together their their dissertation and she's still trying to do it. And it's a tough task. But man, it is it really is a tough task is. <laughs> is all that's all I have to say about that it really is a tough task Um, (laughs) and and I think what's been important to me to see is that that tough task doesn't just exist in a PhD scenario you can always have the opportunity to push the next limits of of human thought and expectations but being able to position yourself in a way where you um you know have, have more sway than others or getting involved, honestly. Um, you know, there's a lot of avenues to, to do those sorts of things if it's important to you. Well put, I love it. (laughs) There's a will, there's a way. Yes, exactly. Well said, Scott. Yeah. Nice. (laughs) Um, okay. So now we're going to just like jump into sort of a slightly different question. Very serious. serious question um how would you solve a scientific problem if you were from jupiter Ooh, great question um well i would like to say that i gave this some thought (laughs) um but i chose jupiter because it's the largest uh gas planet and i was hoping that there would be some room for me to make um, a well-timed fart joke in your podcast. <laughs> Listeners would really appreciate that. <laughs> like, if there's a way to like solve a problem using flatulence, um, that's what I'm here for. Like, why haven't we been harnessing that power on our own? <laughs> Well, my advisor and I are currently trying to calibrate some of our microphones. So, I mean, we could use someone from Jupiter's flatulence as a, a signal to tell us when we start and stop recording. There you go. So, there we go. <laughs> Ways to solve problems on Jupiter have at real life applications on our planet as well. <laughs> oh <my gosh. laughs> like, let's capture those cow farts. Like, let's make those work for us. oh my gosh you guys are so funny (laughs) um okay so another serious question jenna Mm -hmm. kind of completely random but um what are your thoughts on garden gnomes oh they're cute um you know uh okay i (laughs) Sitting in my Amazon wish list for at least a couple of years now is a solar powered garden gnome who's like has his pants down and his like butt <laughs> is exposed and the butt glows. Um, again, this is me exposing myself. Like, it <laughs> but so I feel good about garden gnomes. I'm also like my family's Norwegian and there's a lot of troll lore. Um, so in that sense, I think. They're, they're kind of, there's a Venn diagram of like garden gnomes and, and, and troll lore, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah, I think so. And so in some world that exists on our planet, there's yeah <laughs> crossover. Yeah, there's probably, it's on, I'm sure there's like a Reddit thread where those worlds collide. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Jenna, this has been a fantastic interview. Thank you so much for coming on. And um, I don't know if Scott or Brian have any more questions for you, but you have been so fantastic. And we are so pleased and honored to have you on our podcast. Aw, thanks, guys. It's been great. I have a question for you before you leave, Jenna. Yeah. It's actually probably a difficult one. Um, what, do you, what do you think 
most contributed to the onset of plate tectonics? Ooh, that is a hard one. <laughs> Do you oh, know, man. have you read anything about this concept? Do you know? Plate tectonics, never heard of it. The onset? Oh, <laughs> yeah, I've never heard of that either. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, I... What if, what would your guess be? This isn't my field of expertise and I don't want to sound like an idiot. So can I just quote a tweet I saw the other day? Of course. Okay. <laughs> um, the tweet I'm paraphrasing here um, was something along the lines of like, isn't it amazing how plate tectonics like wasn't necessarily a thought until the 1960s. So like kids in the 1950s would be like, hey mom, isn't it wild how it looks like South America and Africa could fit together. And the mom's like, that's fun, honey. Do you want a cigarette? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so that's my answer to that. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's the perfect answer. <laughs> I wish I, yeah, it's really not um, my That's a, an unfair question <laughs> because no one, we, it, there's, it's like an ongoing debate. Like no one knows. Like yeah. people think it was a large like impact with the earth. And then other people don't understand it at all. So I don't know. <laughs> I am one of the latter. <laughs> <laughs> Could it be like cooling of the core mm. and just like entropy in general? Mm. Like, I, I don't know. know. Kind of like my life. It's like a metaphor for my life. Like it's entropy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Falling apart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a really great answer, I think, and a yeah. really hard question. But yeah, I, I appreciate Scott for asking that because yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's the whole thing is like, there's so many things in science, which we just don't know about either. You know, we, we have these ideas of like, okay, we think this is what's happening, but, but we really actually just were like, we don't actually know. <laughs> so it's awesome. It is. Tonics is a hard one because like on a grand scale, you can observe it. Right. But the mechanism that like, you know, is behind it is much less observable um, mm -hmm. as far as we can tell. And so there's a lot of mysteries, you know, it's like one big mystery with a bunch of mysteries inside of it. That's uh, earth science for you. <laughs> a Russian doll of mystery. <laughs> yeah, seriously, that's a perfect, <laughs> perfect uh, analogy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, great, Jenna, thank you so much. Is there anyone before we leave, is there anyone you want to give a shout out to? Oh boy. Well, I guess Dan Luna. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of shout outs on our podcast. <laughs> What's up, Dan? <laughs> um but also yeah I just want to I guess I'll shout out all of my um you know colleagues education staff here at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History and Sea Center truly the cream of the crop education staff especially when it comes to outdoor education at all ages um and getting getting kids interacting and engaged in in nature science and in their community that's awesome. Also, shout out my dog, Yogi. He can't understand this, but Yogi, if you're listening, you're the cutest boy. <laughs> we have a picture of Yogi on our website, so <laughs> everyone needs to check him out. He's super adorable. <laughs> Don't worry. The, the podcast is very popular among the dog community. I'm glad to hear that. We've okay. already had one dog guest, Baxter, Brian's <laughs> little dog. Aww. Oh, yep. He's around. Yes. Baxter. <laughs> you could hear him coughing in the microphone. And <laughs> oh, Baxter, what a cutie. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, Yogi's a 10 month old border collie and he's like my first dog. And so I have just like recently broken into the world of being obsessed with my dog. <laughs> so. We're Welcome. all those people Welcome. that talk about our pets like children, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, awesome, Jenna. This has been awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. It's been great chatting with you all. Awesome. See you later. See ya. Thanks so much. <laughs> well, that was an epic conversation. 
We'd like to thank all of our listeners. Tune in next time for another Epic Earth podcast.